Yes. Richard Probst, SAP. So if these are the new principles that help us um, think about you know, the theory of networking in a new way, then they all also apply historically. So have you thought about what it would take to take some historical artifact like SNA and think about it according to these abstractions? So, so um, yes and no. What I would say is that, that we haven't gone back to SNA because to some extent this is, this is about control, but we have gone and looked at the, how you would apply this to the data plane abstractions that, that we've all sort of said, oh, those are great, we're happy with. And there, what the analysis says is those are great abstractions. They are lousy interfaces. And if you fix the interfaces, you could do, for instance, everybody says architectural evolution is impossible. It's very hard once you define IP to change it. That's just a fact of life. Bullshit. If we got the interfaces right, we could change IP in a day. That's what we got wrong, because we pass, you know, as an interface, if a first-year graduate student designed something where you passed a location through an interface that didn't need to know about location, we'd fire him or her. Well, that's what we did in the internet. We didn't know any better, but we're stuck with those design decisions. So yes, looking back historically, you can say that by not thinking about it in terms of abstractions and interfaces, we made some elementary mistakes, that if we fix them, we could do a lot better today. Ains, hello? Oh, hey. Nice to work. Hello. This is Wolfgang Riedel working for Cisco. Um, I have more a channel problem. Uh, uh, so it's more like, from my understanding, is, is this the right approach? It's more, I think it's more about identity, and I don't care about the IP address or the location or whatever. So it's like all the enforcement, all the forwarding should be based on the identity for a virtual machine, of a user, or whatever. So the question is, shouldn't be a network just be smart enough to do a forwarding decision or policy enforcement based on identity or not on a programmatic interface. So do you really want to program networks for millions of users around the globe? Or shouldn't this just be a better solution that the network is intelligent enough to deal with these identities? So I, I think it is always a dangerous step to take high-level semantics and expect low-level silicon to understand them because sort of our high-level semantics doesn't stay constant for long, and silicon, unfortunately, does. So um, I think that the notion of identity is actually pretty subtle, and so the way we establish identity is typically through crypto and other kinds of things, and then sort of baking that into a low-level forwarding chip, I think would be a mistake. I think that you want your control program to understand identity at the software level, and then tell the forwarding hardware, I said this is okay, so go ahead and forward it because I understand the semantics. You don't, but trust me. So I do think that you want to bake it into the forwarding overall architecture, but you don't, you don't want to keep it out, you don't want to put it in the very lowest levels. And so SDN, as a way of being able to put it into your software infrastructure in a way that translates directly into your hardware, is exactly what, in, to some extent, what some of our team's early projects were trying to do. Yeah, I agree on the ASIC level. It's more like from a from a point of how you will approach a solution. And this is the point where I think, so I just remember the talk we had yesterday that we expect in the future that network operator, operators are programming the network topology in Python. And I think it's the question if we really expect people to program networks in Python or the network should just be smart enough that I don't have to program a network. That's is my question. So, so I, I, I'm I don't want to be argumentative, no, no, but, it's, but it's my nature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that somehow, when you make a network smart enough, you, you, you are programming it. And the only question is whether you expose it to, to your company or expose it to the world as a whole, that programmatic interface. And I think that's really the only difference. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Scott. Dimitri Stiliadis from Alcada Lucid. I have two of you on comments questions. The one is, Abstraction is, is good, and I love it, but it's also a little dangerous because if we take, for example, you know, a Ruby on Rails programmer, he has absolutely no clue how to optimize a program for the hardware, right? So I need gigabytes of memory today to write the same Microsoft Word document that I would have written 10 years ago with a couple of megabytes in LaTeX. Right. So that's, that's one thing, and how to avoid this trap. My second thing is, does the abstraction need to go all the way to the forwarding element why can't we get, for example, an OSPF area and call it uh, an abstract model of a black box 
and deal with it at the edges. Why do we need to go on every forwarding uh, uh, element? So, so well, let me go to your second thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, when I brought up the idea of the fabric being the forwarding model, yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, whether or not that's where history goes, but I think that would be perfectly fine. For the, the, the abstractions and the performance issue, I think it really is the reason why we have people doing Ruby on Rails is because for that area, it is the speed of development is more important than the speed of execution. That's probably not going to be true in networking. Exactly, it, because you have abundance of resources, right? The abstraction is very easy when no, resources are abundant. But, but, but the problem, it is not so much that the abstractions are so bad, is that you let people program it who don't care about performance. And my guess is the people who program networks, their employer will care a lot about performance because that's what the customers will care about. So that, that I mean, uh, this gentleman brought up, we probably will program it in Python, but that Python won't be on the fast path. It'll be setting up the state, which then can you know, run at fast speeds. Dave McDyson, Verizon. Uh, is there anything we can learn from applications, operating systems, and database principles, such as naming and addressing, that we need to adopt uh, in networking and the abstractions you described? You gave the location example that's a problem with IP. Is there something we can, do we need to relook at you know, some of these basic ways we identify objects in these abstractions uh, as we evolve? So I, I mean, I, I think there are two separate ways that, that I think when you talk about the overall internet architecture, I think absolutely. But when you, when you think about sort of SDN, which is typically thinking about sort of managing one, uh, sort of a network under one domain, there, we don't have to have uniform agreement on what identities mean. It's sort of that, that domain can decide whatever it mean, wants to think about identities. And there, I'm not sure whether there are universal lessons to be learned. But I think certainly when you go to the overall internet architecture and you need to think about a global naming system that applies everywhere, then we, we need to think about what other, other disciplines know. Um. A comment and a question. So the, the comment first is that if we like uh, driving a stick shift, that's because we like performance and not because we like complexity. And, uh, the I, I, I would actually argue with that, but, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, driving in Palo Alto, driving a stick shift, how much performance does it get you? I mean, you know, well, so I can beat you to the next stoplight. You that's know, because to, you're <laughs> driving in Palo Alto. So, and, and the question is that if OpenFlow is a small piece in that SDN picture, what are the other large pieces that we should be working on? Well, no, so I, I think we are working on it. I mean, sort of the network operating system, I think the structure of applications on top, it's sort of all those things that, that work is going on at the time. I think the difference is OpenFlow is something we have to standardize so that we all in this room have to agree on. Network operating system, different people can program it different ways. We don't have to argue to convince each other. You build yours, I build mine. We take a speed test, see who's better. You know, we don't want to do that with OpenFlow because we want everybody to have a uniform standard. So it, it's sort of fundamental for the industry, but it's sort of, that's not the sort of heart of the architecture. It's the heart of what needs to be standardized. Uh, uh, yeah. Greg Papadopoulos, NEA. Yeah. Could, could you just reflect a bit on how we keep from making the same mistakes that we did in the computing side in terms of people controlling APIs? So the OS is, you know, started from OS 360 and then moved out into a bunch of different areas. We took a few decades to get it into, say, Linux. And it looks like the, the mobile OSs are similarly moving out, and who knows what will happen. How, so, do, how do we prevent that from happening? I, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I can't give you a definitive answer except to say that we hopefully should get some open source versions of these interfaces available and so that you know, we, that we soon develop the Linux of the world so that nobody is, is, is blocked out. People may still, you know, go after their proprietary solutions, but if you don't want one, there, there is a sort of open source of version available. That would be my initial thought, but I don't have anything deeper than that. Uh, I, I don't know who's first, so. I, I think he was here first. Uh, great speech. <laughs> Very exciting, I must say. I have two questions, you know, I, I, I heard like uh, controllability, manageability, automation from yesterday's on, but are we also uh, addressing a capacity problem in a, on an internet scale? Capacity problem? Like, you know, in uh, they're talking about data explosion. I, I, I didn't hear much about the, uh, you know, the, the capacity. 
other than the controllability. Yeah, know. so I, I mean, I'm, I, I, no, I'm, I'm not the right one to ask about this. I would assume that the people who know much better than I would answer that, okay. you know, if, if this approach makes it easier to build fast hardware, then that's the way we address the, the capacity problem, is that we've taken some of the complexity off the data path and moved it onto the control mm -hmm. path. But, but I don't think we, you know, we fundamentally don't increase the capacity directly. And um, but, but actually, I would say the networking industry has been pretty phenomenally good at providing high-capacity components. Okay. Uh, probably a, a related question is that in your final words, you, you said the era of um, uh, uh, new protocol, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, protocol so, per problem. Yeah, so you, you mentioned uh, verbally control protocol. So is there a, you know, a need for a new set of uh, data, pro uh, data plane protocols, you know? For instance, replacing uh, internet protocol, for, for instance. Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry. No, there, there's not. It was more that in the data plane, we haven't invented new protocols every time we have a new problem. I mean, TCP is very widely used. HTTP is very widely used. We're very good at reusing there. On the control side, we haven't been as good. But, but I think we, we'll reuse on both now as opposed to invent, you know, sort of ad hoc invention on the control side. Okay. Okay. Hi, uh, Derek Silva from Infotech Research Group. Um, on a more practical day-to-day -day level. Then, then you need to talk to Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought so. <laughs> Maybe Martin can, can come up and answer this. Like, what does this mean for a network admin who's maybe rebuilding a, you know, or building a brand new network or is bringing in OpenFlow and some SDN components and, and, and putting those on top of the network in terms of what's still being done at the switch level and what's being done. So, so the... I, I actually, I mean, I, I, I was joking the first time, but I okay. actually do think Mar <laughs> Martin's the right person to answer that. Do you want to take that? Sure. Can you, can you turn this on here? Um, so I, I think it's, it's just really important to remember um, that, I mean, OpenFlow is for Come system on. builders. And... Um, it's not actually for, for end users of, 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 of networks. And so the way that you evaluate how OpenFlow helps you is to evaluate the products that are built on it. And these products are going to be totally different uh, or from, from each other, but they can look very similar to existing components you have today. So for example, I mean, people are building BGP routers that look, smell, taste, and run exactly like BGP routers, but they're running using OpenFlow on top of Merchant Silicon. So there's nothing different about that. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't think that the, the question we should be asking is what does OpenFlow do for random operator X? It's like, what can third party Y do to provide something new? And I think that, you know, this is the question we're gonna answer in the next couple of years. Is that fair? Yeah. Thanks. Could we make this the last question maybe? Or? Okay. Is, okay, is this one? Or who? Pushan Kanekar, I'm from Cisco. I have a question, uh, maybe. Yeah, Martin. You <laughs> <laughs> Martin. So basically, what I understand is essentially a lot of the abstractions, whatever you're talked about, inside a switch or a router, a lot of it happens, but those are only available to the, that company. So it's essentially a vertically integrated stuff. What you're trying to do is essentially make it horizontal. It's a great way, but that now leads you to, and to give an analogy, say on a Microsoft model, on the hardware comes from Intel and a bunch of other hardware. You've got Microsoft's OS running on it, and you've got a bunch of applications. You've got VMware in, so, so somewhere in the middle of it. The issue with that when today happens is if, if your PC crashes, who do you go and find? Is it the application's fault? Is it the virtualization's fault? Is it the hardware problem, or is it the OS problem? Now, today in networking, because it's vertically integrated, if a router fails, you go catch Cisco or Uniper or Brocade or whoever is the hardware. To, with this horizontal model, suppose you have the NYSERA controller controlling the NEC switch and network doesn't work, where do you think the operator, sh whom should the operator contact? NYSERA. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, sir, I mean that, 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 you know, there will be the people who sell these systems will have a well-understood chain of debugging and who you contact first, and that'll be part of how the market develops. Um, you know, I mean, I, I said that somewhat facetiously, but I actually think it's the right answer, which is you probably start with the people who provide you the software that will have the much best understanding of the system overall, and then they will be able to isolate whether it's a hardware problem or not. But, I mean, the, the problem you raise is, 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 a, is a real one, but the market will solve it. Okay. Meaning that, that, you know, 
People will buy vertically integrated if, if this is a, such a serious concern they can't get good answers from other people. And you know, people, some people buy Apple, some people buy the you know, Microsoft on top of Intel, you know, largely for this reason of depending on how much they want to just go to a sort of you know, a genius and say, fix it, I don't want to understand, or they, they want to debug it themselves. But this gives us the option, but the concern you raise is a valid one. Right. Okay, the last question, one more. The last, does, last question. Does this one work? Wow. Ah, yes, it, it does. Um, Neil Swart, you know if that works. So I think one of the major challenges that most of, uh, most of the people who use our equipment and, and everyone else's equipment in this room uh, is not necessarily one of optimizing um, what's already there, but figuring out how can I monetize information that I have in my network, inf you know, uh, availability and bringing new APIs to application developers so that their network becomes uh, sort of more valuable to end users or the information that's there more valuable to end users. Um, would you say that um, you know, SDN, as in software-driven networking, is a good step in the direction of software-defined networking uh, to get us from this notion of hardware-centric and box-centric to a more software-oriented world? I, I didn't understand most of your question. I mean, I, I, the, the, the distinction between software-driven and software-defined, I, I, I honestly I, I don't know what you're driving at. Um, what I'm driving at is today, uh, carriers have a challenge of, of make, basically running their network and actually making money off that network. Uh, a lot of information is available inside those networks today that can be used to monetize their existing infrastructure. Okay. Um, getting from where they are right now, where that information is locked inside of a, a network device to a point that they can uh, expose and monetize it, will take a few steps. Um, going from where they are today to an entire software-defined infrastructure also takes you know, a number of years, as you, as you mentioned is software-driven networking, as in one where network equipment talks much more uh, intimately to applications and applications talk much more intimately to networks, is that an intermediate step that you would suggest in this path towards no. SDN? No, I, I think it's actually the wrong step. Meaning, I would think that having networks that sort of provide, for instance, a very familiar interface right now, but underneath are much more flexible, is gonna lead to much more rapid adoption and then we can start learning to use the, the much more general features of them rather than doing it the other way around. So that, you know, I, I think that some of the early uses of SDN are basically to say, I'm going to take this big, expensive single switch, I'm going to replace it with a bunch of smaller switches and create a, BG, sort, of a, a you know, sort of a virtual v, BGP router. I understand how that interacts with the rest of my network, so I'm not really changing the rest of my network. I've just changed this one component and I've built it in a way that's cheaper, more flexible. Um, that, I think, is just the easier deployment path, whereas sort of monetizing all this information that lies in my network, that, that's sort of a larger sort of institutional change that, that while well, well, I think it's great, is not where I would start. Okay. Thanks. Okay, with that, let's thank Scott again. Mm -hmm.